like I was starting to tell you before I hit the record button, I was at Joe's albums in Worcester the, the not too long ago, and he gave me a cassette deck because I've been trying to find one, right? So I oh, found man. all I found all these radio tapes that I did when I was at college radio, and Jimmy yeah. D was supposed to, Jimmy D'Angelo was supposed to come up and do a show and he never showed up. So I'm up there all night long on the air promoting the show. And then, and it turns out that Jimmy didn't have a phone number to call me because, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have anything back then. We didn't have computers, cell phones, nothing. So it's not yeah. like he blew me off. He just totally, uh, he couldn't make it. Something came up and I was on the air all night saying, Jimmy's on his way. Jimmy's on his oh, way. Oh, geez. Really? Oh man. Rest in peace, our friend, Mr. D'Angelo. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy D, you got it. So, Mr. Thayer, um, tell me about some of the first music that you started listening to when you were a teenager, because that would be in the 60s, right? I hate to out your age here in front of the world, but... <laughs> yeah, no, you know, before the Beatles came along, the music was pretty uh, bland, let's put it that way, I'll be nice. Uh, you had songs like It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To, or I Want to Be Bobby's Girl, or Leader of the Pack, you know, stuff like that. Hey, I liked Leslie Gore, though, man. So be careful, all right? Yeah. No, hey, hey, <laughs> she, uh, hey she, was, she was at the top of her game, man. But yeah, there wasn't, uh, well, there was, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. I forgot. Chubby Check or Twist. Twistin', you know. Um it, it, the songs were, uh, you know, boy meets girl, girl gets stood up at, you know what I mean? That type of stuff back then. Um, and that's what I was listening to as an early teenager till the Beatles came along. And, uh, you know, you had songs like, like Do the Limbo, you know, stuff like that. I remember going to what they called sock hops back then, uh, record hops. And, uh, they do the limbo and they do uh, the twist and they'd have these little, you know, contests like that. It was mainly like uh, I got a 1958 or, or 1960 Chevy with a souped up V8 engine and I can drive that car faster than you. And, you know, that type of stuff. So what what kind of turned it around for you? Was it the Beatles, in fact, that actually oh, got you? Geez. Yeah, I remember the first time that I actually heard a song by them. And it was in, I think it was in December of 1962, I believe. It was before they did the Ed Sullivan show. So was that 61 or 60? When did they do the Ed Sullivan? Was that 62, February 62? You know, I personally, I think it was like 64, but I could be wrong about that because oh, you I know. know what? I think you're right. I think you're right because the, didn't Hard Day's Night come out in 64? Uh, yeah, you 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 need me to open my Wikipedia page or something to like remember all this. <laughs> all right. Well, it was it was before it was like a couple months before they did the Ed Sullivan show, and um, yeah, and I think I think you're right. I think it probably was uh, sixty three because they were big in sixty two in England. That's when they started hitting it big. Anyways, I was w walking up the steps to the town hall where we had the sock cops on the second floor, and it's, and you know it's this old town hall it was probably built in like seventeen sixty. Was this was this in Webster, Bellingham, 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 Massachusetts? Okay, yeah, yeah exactly. And I heard them playing. I want to hold your hand. You know, they were just getting ready to do it, and they were just kind of checking out the sound system. And I'm going, whoa. Who are these guys, right? This is great. And um, that did it. And, you know, uh, they hit the airways back then out here. And then February, they did the Ed Sullivan show. And that was it. I was sold. At that point, that's, uh, I was I was a big fan. Did, did you pick up a bass guitar soon thereafter? That, or did you play guitar first? Or what did you play first for an instrument? No, I wasn't. I was a singer. I was singing in church. So basically, my next door neighbor, he he picked up the guitar, and he of course he wanted to do some of those songs because by now it was starting to get into springtime, and you had the British invasion. You had the animals doing uh, "House of the Rising Sun." In fact, I think that might have been the first song they ever learned, and so he needed the singer, right? But he also needed a bass player, right? <laughs> so he said, hey, wait, we'll do like Paul McCartney. 
He goes, uh, your dad's got an acoustic guitar. Let's just uh, put four strings and a pickup on it, and you play bass. <laughs> wow, that's that, how you did it. That's That was, yeah, that was it. Uh, House of the Rising Sun. Then I think this boy, I can't remember, stuff like that started learning. And uh, that's how it started. Do you remember your next door neighbor's name? Uh, Michael Desjarlis. De Michael Desjarlis. Did, did he end up playing in bands and stuff? Or was that like, no, no. I have no idea what happened to him because <laughs> here's the thing. The following, and that summer, um, we used to do like, uh, they call it karaoke now, but we would play. There was another house down the street where um, we would go up in the in the uh, loft in the barn. Uh, the Mueller's. It was uh, the name was the Mueller's were the people there, and we would uh, you know make believe we were on stage singing all those Beatles songs like Anna and uh, all the things on their first album that came over. And we were just like making believe we were singing them. And then um, I remember uh, with that band, with, with Michael uh, Dejarlis there, we were, we were supposed to do a battle of the bands down in uh, another part of Bellingham. I actually strapped, by that time I went out and bought a cheap tempo bass from Sears right? At some place like that. <laughs> I strapped it on the back of the bicycle and I rode that bike about, oh, I mean, it was about seven miles away. Rode that bike to the Battle of the Bands. We played, didn't win, but that was it. And then my parents got divorced and that following summer we uh, we moved and, and that's when we moved to Webster. Webster, Massachusetts, where I'm also from. And that's, you know, we didn't get to know each other back then because you were a couple of years older than me. But I went to school with your brother, Jim, Jimmy, yeah. my good friend. And mm -hmm. uh, so so that's when you started really getting into more serious bands when you got to Webster, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I might have gone to play sports, but when I when we moved to Bartlett, you couldn't play football if you were a freshman. You had to be a sophomore grade. So, you know, what I said, I met another kid who played guitar, Michael Faraday, and uh, we started to get together and, and play in bands, and that's when it all started in the uh, summer. Let's see, that would have been the six, 1965, the summer of 65, and uh, into the fall there. Do you remember your first band? Well, besides the band from Bellingham, that is. <laughs> yeah, that was Section 5. Section 5. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and I know that you ended up hooking up with the some guys from Oxford, right? Right. Well, that that uh, friend of mine that I hooked up with in Webster, Michael Faraday, he also had some friends in Oxford, and they were also playing guitars and getting into music. And so I remember we went out. We we, I don't know how the hell we even got out there, but we got we got out there, and they lived. Uh, there were two, it was a drummer that lived in one house. That was, his name was uh, uh, Gonzalo uh, Pokerpovich. We call him Speedy, Speedy, Speedy Gonzalez. Of course he did. <laughs> then his next door neighbor um, played guitar. And then, now this is the funny thing. So that summer we started jamming together. And then there was another musician and, you know, kids were picking up, you know, that day and, you know, you talk to anybody from that period. Everybody wanted to pick up a guitar and, and play and be like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or right. the Animals, you know, all those guys. And so this is, I remember we walked up the street and I think it was on a Saturday from those other guys there, Speedy's house. And we met Paul Trinchick or Paul Cox, as he's right. known professionally. And that's when we formed Section 5 with Speedy as the drummer, me as the bass player, Paul as the guitar player. Well, he met another kid from that same neighborhood, Michael Goff, and he was the rhythm guitar player. And that was section five. And we we were getting into writing original songs, and we actually recorded our first record. I think I was 16, 17 years old and, uh, you know, got it played on the local station on in Worcester. And Jimmy was already doing that with a band he had called The End. Jimmy D'Angelo? Yeah. Yeah. 
So was there an actual 45 of Section 5? Because I never saw that. Yeah, I have. I have it. Never oh. played it. it. Well, and here's the funny thing, Rico. Um, I didn't have a copy of that record, right? Uh, up until maybe 10 years ago. And uh, but my sister had one, but it was you couldn't play it. It was all tore up toward you could you know, it was no good, right? But it was there. <laughs> and uh what the heck happened? Oh, oh boy, you ready for a story here? That's why we're here. We like the rock and roll stories, Donald. <laughs> Donald. I never this called is, you that before. <laughs> so basically that's that song, you know, never made it past Worcester, right? Never made it out of it was played at Worcester and we got some local fame out of the whole thing, but not much. And uh, anyways, fast forward to probably year 2010, right around there, about 10, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I was working with this young kid at my work and uh, he, he found out that I had a background in music and he came to me one day and he said, Hey, is this you? Because he went on the internet, right? Yeah. And there was a song called Pusher's Root, which was a song I wrote on that single, was the B-side of that single. And I said, wow, I wonder if this is the same song, right? <laughs> and so he, he played it, and I'm going, holy crap. Where did you find this? <laughs> right? He found it on the internet and it was a and then a, well, there's another story behind this here. I thought it was a record. I thought I could buy it, right? It was on a compilation of um, what do they call it? Uh, like songs of the 60s, uh, like drug songs of the 60s. I can't remember <laughs> the name songs. of it. It was like it was like that. Something got crazy like that. And uh, yeah. And so um I did I thought I could buy it. And I tried looking around to see if I could buy it. I couldn't figure it out. And I asked him, he goes, Oh no, you can't buy these things. You have to download them. <laughs> what? What's a download? <laughs> All right. Um, that's good. It's good stuff. Um, so did you ever meet Jimmy D or Joey D'Angelo back then before you guys ended up playing together? Did you meet them before or did you like how did you end up in Mad Angel? Um through through Jimmy D, and it was because we we played a lot locally at different things. So I hadn't really met him personally or any of uh, any of them, but we knew of each other because we played all the same places, you know, like that. They were the house band at the comic strip, so they were like quote the the band. They were like the big band during that day. They were we playing were with all the any of the famous bands that came to town. Was this yeah. the Joneses? Yeah. The Joneses. Yeah, the Joneses. Yeah. yeah. Now, right. where was the comic strip? Was that in Worcester? Yeah, that was right down. You know where the uh, Rotary is down there? I think by the old uh, auditorium, Worcester Auditorium. Yes. Yes. Lincoln okay. Square, it I was think right they called there. something. Wow. It was right there. Yeah, it was called the comic strip. And they had all the, uh, the British bands and all the all the popular bands of the day playing there. Uh, they had, um, geez, I can't even think of them all now. I think the Animals even played there. Uh, the Young Rascals played there several times. I really love that band. I used to go see them. But the Jones is back with a house band. They backed everybody wow. else. Up. And they were, I mean, when, when they played a Beatles song, the Joneses, it sounded just like the Beatles song. And we couldn't figure out why can't we get it? Well, you know why? Because the Beatles used a lot of seventh and sixth chords and stuff like that. We didn't know those chords. We only knew major chords, you know? Right. Or major or minor, really simple. But Joey D'Angelo had a background in music and he knew all that stuff. And Joe is really good. Oh, yeah, he is. Oh, that's a, that's a B major seventh with, a, with an A but you know overtone you know what i mean i believe it or not i took guitar lessons from joey d'angelo when i was in college uh in the late 70s and he was the best you could walk in there with a tape like i remember i yeah. brought some ian hunter songs with me from all american alien boy album 
And I say, can you show me these? And he listened to the song one time and he showed me the whole song. It was incredible. Oh, yeah. The guy had an ear like he, he still plays with a lot of people. I mean, he's probably the best guitar player in the Worcester area, you know, with Duke Levine and him and Duke Levine are probably the best. Steve Aquino. There's a few good guitar players there, but he's at the top of the heap. So how yeah. did you end up? How did Matt Angel all come together? Well, uh, they were looking for somebody to replace. They had they blown up um, D'Angelo, DNZ, D'Angelo Norris Sicaro, which was a uh, a modified version of the Joneses. Uh, they went through a couple of incarnations <laughs> back then. They had Jamie Peace for a yeah, while in the, the Joneses. late great remember? Jamie Peace, yeah. And then they went to DNZ. They tried to resurrect that band and. Uh, I guess it wasn't working out. So they needed a bass player. And they also needed one of the criticisms, I guess, that they had was they needed somebody that could sing on top. They had a you know good range, a high voice. And uh, yeah, Jimmy reached out to me. And at the time, um, I don't know if we were in between what was going on, but I had been playing a band called Hard Road. And that, that was that was the the metamorphosis of section five where we changed uh, we got chris boodlehead in the band and uh, we were called hot road we were doing a lot of clubs then we were doing some originals and that's how um, i got a call from jimmy saying hey you know we uh we need a bass player you you uh are you interested <laughs> nice the rest of, the rest is history yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I know there was uh, was can't run can't run can't hide and sweet sleep. Was that one single or was that two separate singles? No, that was that was two separate uh, singles. Um, can't run can't hide was the first one that we that uh, we tried to, that we released. I can't remember what was on the flip side of it though. Uh, fact, That's why I, I was. I the... That's why I thought it was the set, one single because I couldn't remember that either. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. But I remember then we did, uh, oh, you know what? I'd have to, I'd have to check, but maybe Sweet Sleep was the A side and Can't Run, Can't Hide was the B side. Uh, I'd have to look it up. But it, it was only, uh, uh, what, 40 years ago? Yeah, right. 40, 45 years ago. Yeah, it's just it's just a few Well, years, yeah. Mad Angel became a very big band in the area. In fact, Aerosmith used to open for the for you guys and stuff. And then mm -hmm. I know they returned the favor and put you on that famous show at Westboro Speedway. Why don't you talk about that? Because I I was a little kid, I couldn't go, but I know it was Aerosmith, uh Duke and the Drivers, and Mad Angel. And apparently it was one of the biggest concerts in Worcester County history at that time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, we were all, including Duke and the Drivers. Um, the interesting thing is Duke and the Drivers took Hard Road's drummer. <laughs> so he was playing with them. Bobby Chouinard, who went on to be. Oh, one yeah. Guy. Yeah, he uh, stroke me, stroke me guy. Uh, Billy Squire, yeah. But Piper, Billy Squire. Was he in Piper and then Billy Squire? Yeah, yes. I think he was. Well, well Bobby wasn't, I don't think Bobby was in Piper, but he went with Billy Squire when Billy went solo. Anyways, so back in those days, we were all, you know, releasing stuff. And uh, Aerosmith had released uh, Dream On, you know, a Get Your Wings album that they, you know, most of us were recording in intermediate studios in Boston, including them. And uh, so they were, you know, promoting that Dream On, and they got uh, Duke and the Drivers, and then uh, was another popular Boston band at that that period and then of course uh mad angel um who they had backed us up back in worcester you know back probably the year before were they any good when they used to open for you guys did you see a band there that you thought was going to be great because i remember mark bell was on the show you know mark bell from uh right. thunder train and mm -hmm. joe perry project he told me he went to see the joneses actually one time in right. medway probably that place, the hungry lion that I had trouble finding one time, but I found, and he said he saw them the first time. And he was like, what in the world? He looked at Steven Tyler, like, what, what is this guy? Were they a good band at that time? Or were they developing? They were developing. Um, they were trying to be the next Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> 
and and the thing was we were doing a lot of uh beatles beatley stuff right back then beatlesque yeah doing rolling, they were doing rolling stones so it was like that dichotomy stones beatles type of sound and music and influence right um but I kept, I do remember thinking that Rolling Stones, I think Tyler was trying to be the next Mick Jagger. <laughs> Did you have relationships with those guys? I didn't, but Jimmy and Joey did, you know, because uh, that had developed before I, before we create that, but developed during the Joneses in the uh, DNZ period of time. I kind of skipped backwards a minute. So the Westboro Speedway show, what's your recollection of that? That was great. I loved doing that show. Um, we were doing big shows like that at that time as Mad Angel. So when we did this one here. It was nice because it was, you know, home home turf, so to speak. We weren't we weren't traveling out to New York or Canada. Or uh, we did a lot of big shows up University of New Hampshire and stuff like that. But this was nice because it was local, you know. So we got all a lot of local exposure back then. I remember it was it was nice. It was a uh, it was a good concert. Um, had a good time and uh, music was great and of course uh, you know Aerosmith went on dream on and all that they they just took off from there they certainly did now um, I wanted to talk to you about Pretty Poison a bit but I wanted to put a wrapping on the Mad Angel thing do you recall how it came to an end because that band was around for a few years and you guys were doing really well but somehow it ended yeah, it we 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 had done, of course, uh, Sweet Sleep, and we had worked with BASF Records, and we had done Sweet Sleep, and we had released Magic in in Your Eyes, but we weren't getting the um, the management support that like Aerosmith got, you know, that they went on with with that big management firm out of New York City, you know, Conley and those uh, and other people. Uh, we didn't have that. And so we weren't getting any traction. And I think it had been a long road for Joe and Robbie and Jimmy, where they thought, you know what, um, we, we've we tried. And it just got to the point where um, everybody wanted to try something else, so to speak. You know what I mean? They wanted to go in a different direction and try something else to see if that worked. Yeah, it was it was an amicable type of thing. We just got together and said, "Hey, it was kind of like with the Beatles." When John and George said, "Hey, you know what? Um, we want to do something different. Move on." And so that basically was uh, what was the end of Mad Angel. We had a good run when we did it. Uh, we just wanted to see if we could. We just weren't getting anywhere fast at that point, and I think people just get kind of tired of spinning their wheels so to speak but you and jimmy ended up i don't know if it was right away but you ended up starting another band and how did mm -hmm. that all happen i was at the first pretty poison gig i'll never forget that it was at the penthouse in leicester massachusetts at the old leicester airport and uh -huh. it was the first night the band played you guys played three nights in a row there that's how you start. It was packed every night. How did you and Jimmy plan to start another band or did it, how did it all come together? Well, Jimmy's one of those guys that he, he always wants to put a band together. Right. And so he starts, you know, he, he Jimmy would network. Jimmy was really good at networking with musicians around the area because they knew him from the Joneses. You know, he, Jimmy had a reputation that went back years, you know, into the, into the mid 60s and um he got together with paul cox uh because paul was playing in a band uh, cox newton taylor at the time and the uh you know the common denominator in a lot of that was michael brannon he was he the was manager a, yeah yeah he was the manager he was a promoter he booked a lot of these bands like us like hard road um, and uh, Cox Newton Taylor and a lot of the nightclubs. And, you know, he formed a relationship with Jimmy. And um, I think that's, I'd have to ask Paul that, but from what I understand, uh, Jimmy contacted Paul and I think Dave Amato 
a couple of guys from ICE, and, which was Dave Amato, who went, you know, Dave went on to bigger, bigger things. Still, Ario Speedwagon, yeah, Ario Speedwagon right now, and Louis Santoro, and so he put that band together. Now, then, uh, from what I remember, uh, Dave took off to go to California to pursue some other things that had come up for him, and they needed somebody that could sing, you know, in that range, and they needed a bass player. And, and from what I understand, when Dave was in the band, they took turns playing bass, Paul and Dave, in terms of uh, depending on the songs and, and everything. So at that point, um, Jimmy called me up and says, hey, Donnie, you want to, you know, uh, come try, we're doing this thing, you know, and I got introduced to Louie. And of course, I knew Paul, so that was like a reunion for me, me and Paul. And uh, Pretty Poison was formed, and geez, I'll tell you, the uh, chemistry was really good between Paul, Jimmy, me, and Louie. And uh, especially Paul and Jimmy, because they, they were on the same page, so to speak, in terms of their style of playing. Joe is great. As you know, Joe is really good. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got some jazz influence there. Uh, He's got a lot of those more jazz oriented, more progressive, I call it progressive mm -hmm. guitar play, kind of like, kind of like Steve Howe in uh, Yes. Yeah. Um, if I remember. And so Joe was more on that track. He, he liked that. That was more of a challenge for him where Jimmy and Paul were both pop oriented. You know, obviously, you know, Jimmy's playing style of playing. Paul's style of playing was a lot like um, uh, Brian May of Queen. And uh, I thought really you were going to say I, I thought you were going to say Steve Marriott for a minute, because I always he, he liked I know he likes Steve Marriott and Humble Pie. Yes. You guys covered a Humble yeah. Pie song. I remember that. Yeah. About 30 days in the hole. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the yeah. image of the band was a really well crafted image. And I'll probably use a photo the the actual promo photo to promote this podcast, because to me, it's like a perfect photo i don't know who came up with that idea the couch photo i'm talking about but it's fantastic do you remember that whole photo shoot i think you oh, might yeah. have told me it was in new york yeah we we did that photo shoot down new york yeah i think paul and jimmy i think got into the you know they like putting the boas on all that sort of stuff it was a glam you know, look stuff. you guys were glam yeah right yeah it was yeah it was a grand glam look back then Satin pants, velvet pants, you know, the open shirts, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I liked how all you guys sang in that band. The three front guys all sang their own songs and everything. And you cut through a couple of cool covers in, you know, yeah. and uh, the, the band never made an album, though, which is a mystery to me. Why do you think that never happened? Good question. I think we we started well. We did some recordings. In fact, I think you've got some. Yes, I uh, do. We did. We just never put anything together, put it out. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with our with management. You know, if you don't have that, that was the difference. The way I see it, looking back in hindsight, and if I have any lessons to tell any musicians going forward, is is you got to have the management, and that is a big deal. That was the difference between us and Aerosmith. They started out, in fact, we thought they were crazy. They were given their manager, the, the, I don't have anything to confirm this, but the story was they were splitting 50-50 with him. We thought that was crazy. Now, <laughs> give any more than 10, 15% to your manager, mm -hmm. that's plenty. They were going, but, but their management company at the time, and I forgot the guy's name. Um, I want to say it was Conley, John Conley. Uh, I mean, he was he was pushing them, promoting them, <laughs> in fact, uh, and then he got them signed with um, the other management company that they even they even went back to uh, back when they uh, got it was back it Tim together Collins against... and Barrasso and yes. Collins. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's him. Yeah. Out of New York. And uh, that was it. Uh, we had my, <laughs> we had Michael Brandon. <laughs> So, you know, did you guys realize that you were kind of like, I know you were playing good gigs and everything, but did you realize that it was it was not going out of New England and it was kind of stuck? Right. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. And that was that was the breakup period. 
was realizing we aren't going anywhere fast. This isn't happening. We need to change management. You know, we need to, to uh, get out, <laughs> get into something outside of Worcester and New England. You know what I mean? Um, and that was that was where the the that was the dividing point of the band right there. Um, and uh, that was the difference of opinion. Well, I know uh, that you ended up moving to California and Louie mm-hmm. and Jimmy actually stayed together and did August. Um, what made right. you decide that you needed to bolt out of town and head out to L.A.? I mean, at, at that point, you had a solo record out. You had a single out. Mm-hmm. You had that Nobody But Me cover mm-hmm. single. I remember that. And you had your full length yeah. album. But you had released those here before you moved to California, right? Right, right. I had to release those locally. But I wasn't getting any traction because at that time, the music scene in Boston had changed over to bands like uh, uh, The Cars and uh, Till Tuesday. The style that the management or record labels were looking for back then was that Boston sound. Well, I didn't have that. I was more pop-oriented. And uh, so I didn't, wasn't getting any traction on those. Re- I'm proud of those recordings. I right. mean, I, probably the one thing I ever did that I've got to, as some kind of legacy is that. And um, yeah, we weren't getting any traction, even though the musicians that I had there, uh, Steve Kowalik on guitar, boy, I wish I could find him. I don't know where he is these days. Uh, I still keep in touch with my drummer. And um uh, but uh, yeah, they were great guys, and they and they worked really well in that type of genre that I had. But I wasn't getting any traction. Meanwhile, I'd been out to California, and I knew that music scene out there was more broader. You know, it wasn't like the Boston sound. It was a bigger, bigger world, and it's the type of thing that you say, Rico. You know, oh, you go. Let me go see what I can do with the big boys, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I know so I you moved out to. I was going to say, I know that you actually almost or you auditioned with Ronnie Montrose because we had talked about yeah. that before. And yes, wh- what's did. your recollection of that? Well, that was that was cool. That uh, I mean, Ronnie's a great guy. I mean, I really he probably won't remember me coming up there, I guess. But, uh, you know, he passed yeah, we, away a couple of years ago. Did you know that? I know. Yeah, I know that when I saw that, it's kind of saddened whenever something like that happens. But uh, yeah, I was shopping tapes around. I was doing a lot of session work. I was doing jingles in the studio. I was networking with other singer songwriters, uh, just getting around. I was doing backup vocals. I mean, I did several, uh, when Kenny Loggins would come to town, did several uh, concerts with him in Los Angeles as backup singing. Uh, so I was doing a lot of that. I got a I t- I'll tell you something, Rico, is, is with, I, and I tell this to other musicians, you got to go where the music scene is. You got New York, you got Los Angeles, and nowadays you got Nashville. If you want to make it, you got to go out there. Look at the guy here. I'll give you a good example. Guns N' Roses, right? They, um, I think they were originally from Illinois or Indiana. Somewhere Indiana. Out there. Indiana. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least yeah. the singer yeah. was. <laughs> Yeah, well, so was the so was uh, the guitar player. I think Izzy was his name. I can't remember yeah, exactly. Yeah, Izzy Stradlin. Yes. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, Izzy Stradlin, and uh, they they did what what I wanted us to do with Pretty Poison, is they came out to, to L.A., and then they got some of the L.A. musicians together, and here you got Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah. Um, future future Hall of Famers. Yeah. I uh, I think they're already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, actually. Not that I'm the hugest Guns N' Roses fan in the world, but <laughs> um, I'm not going to diss them. But um, I wanted to talk to you also about the reunion shows that happened in Worcester in around 2013, I think it was, um, I went, when they decided, John Curtis, I believe, decided to have a night of Jimmy D'Angelo bands, which I thought was pretty cool. I was surprised they picked the Hanover, and I never imagine that they could fill that place but i was there and guess what 
You guys fill the place. And you were there and you played with two bands that night. So what was it like? And how did you, did you get a phone call out of the blue or something? I mean, how did that come up? Well, two years prior in 2010, uh, how did I, yeah, a phone call? I forgot how I got contacted. Um, but I, I, it might have been John Curtis that reached out to me. I don't know how how I got the uh, the call or whatever. But uh, yeah, and um, so they wanted, they originally were thinking of doing it. And this was in 2010 now. This is two years before the actual show. Right. <laughs> and uh, my, my mother had recently been diagnosed with mesothemiola. And so I was coming out there in 2010 to visit her uh, at that time. And it was around, uh, it was around Halloween, I think. Cause we had a horrible snowstorm freak snowstorm that, that time. And uh, so we decided to get together at Jimmy's house there in uh, Leicester. On the and, lake. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah. So we all got, got together there. We, we got together in the, like early afternoon and it was like, so, uh, so good to be together and talking and sharing stories and, and music and everything else <laughs> before we knew it a snowstorm had started <laughs> and it was we were plow, plowed in <laughs> by the time we were walked outside going holy crap what happened out here was this just mad angel at that time yeah it was just mad angel guys yeah when, when it, did it, 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 it I was going to say, when did it evolve into all the bands it played? And Pretty Poison actually reunited, which I was very excited about, by the way. Well, I think when, when John Curtis realized that, you know, we could do this, pull, get Mad Angel together and do it, um, I think it kind of evolved out of that. And, uh, yeah, and that's how it was because I, I think originally it was going to be just Mad Angel, then Pretty Poison. And then, of course, they started bringing in, okay, well, we're going to bring in these guys. What else can we do here? And so it became the bands of Jimmy D'Angelo. Yeah, and uh, it was an incredible night. I mean, you must have good memories of that night. Yeah, I do. I do. A lot of theaters showed up. Your entire family was practically there from California. Hey, they, yeah. I mean, years have gone by now. Uh, they had their own kids, and their own kids had heard stories about this. So <laughs> it's like, oh, we'll go see Uncle Donnie. <laughs> we heard stories about him. <laughs> and I think I thought all the bands were really good that night. I mean, I for me, you know, everyone was you know was looking forward to the to the headliner, which was Mad Angel. But I really enjoyed Pretty Poison. Um, August was kind of sad because Jamie Pease was such an important part of that band. So for him not to be there kind of left a little bit of a void. But John Butcher and Charlie Farron both sat in with those guys, Dave and Jimmy, and they kind of filled it in for him. Yeah. Um, but it was still difficult without Jamie. Other than that, I thought the night was like just fantastic. Yeah, and I, I really liked that they paid they paid a nice tribute to Jamie also. That was special. Yeah, did you know Jamie very well? No, not that well. Because, um, of course, I replaced uh, him. And, and Mar well, it was interesting because Marty was there too, Marty Norris. And uh, I replaced those guys. So it was a little tenuous. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, with Marty, it was, was great to kind of talk to him and, and uh, see him now. But I never really did. I mean, I've seen Jamie play with them, but I never met Jamie one on one. I only knew him through Jimmy and Joey and Robbie and those guys. Of course, we lost Jimmy D'Angelo a few years ago. Before I let you go, I was hoping you'd say a few words about Jimmy because I know you guys knew each other for since you were kids, really. Yeah, you know what, Jimmy was. Jimmy was great. He was a great songwriter, great guitar player, great person. You know, if Jimmy would have gotten his butt to L.A., he'd be probably either playing in a in a major band. You know, he would have made he would have made a big mark 
on that music scene because he had he had the right stuff. Yeah, he used to put his cigarette and his guitar on the top of his guitar before Eddie Van Halen did it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that cigarette dangling out of Jimmy's mouth a lot when he played, man. He was, uh, he had that rock and roll vibe, man, for sure. Um, yeah. So do you listen to a lot of music these days? You know, I, I do and I, I don't. I don't listen to enough of it. Um, but when I hear a good song, I mean, it just really captures me. Uh, you know, I got, you know, Ed, you know, Ed Sheehan, guys like throwback guys I really like. Uh, I like a lot of blues stuff. Um, you know, I'm back from those 60s era type of things and Whenever I hear some of that influence coming through in the music, it really, I really like that. I really like, I always love a great singer. Um, yeah, I remember a long time ago, you told me that Joni Mitchell was one of your favorite singers. And she wasn't really, well, she's rock, but not really heavy rock or anything, you know, but she wrote some great songs. Uh, she's got such a way with lyrics. It, it's her lyrics and her, and her vocal style. I mean, nobody yeah. had a vocal style like her. She's a great singer, great songwriter. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, man, thanks a lot, man, for taking the time to talk to me about all this stuff. I know I had to jangle your your memory a little bit with some of this, but you 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 got all you got it all. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Oh, well, thanks, Rick. Appreciate you, man. You you keeping us all all uh, memories all alive here. Trying to keep the rock and roll alive. <laughs> hey, got it. There's not many of us left now these days. There, uh, just getting to that point, you know. Thanks, Donnie. All right, man. I'll catch up with you later.